Well, good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to another day of Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. My topic today is sacrificing fun for dot dot dot. Sacrificing fun for. I'm going to deal with seven areas that you and I can grow and develop and be nurtured and be strengthened if we're willing to sacrifice fun. Now, the environment in the day in which many of us live, maybe not all of us, but many of us, fun seems to be the drum that many people are beating. You know, I sat in a meeting recently where a bunch of leaders were told in order to attract people, in order to engage people, they need to be more fun. And I guess, you know, I agree with some of those things and they have their place, but I suspect that if you are <clears throat> thinking the way I'm thinking, and obviously you don't know how I'm thinking yet because you haven't heard me yet on this matter, but if you're thinking the way I'm thinking, hey Faith, good morning, uh, I think your thoughts will be a little bit different. Because fun and having fun, I think, destroys the opportunity for us to do a lot of things that we'd like to accomplish. And the idea in scripture is it's a little bit different from God's perspective. And I hope to make that case this morning. All right, so my topic today is sacrificing fun for. At this point, I think it's gonna be a series. There's no way I'm gonna complete it today. And so I'm gonna make this, I don't know, three part, six part, seven part. We'll see, you know, we'll see how it evolves. Uh, what I will say, if you have the mindset as a parent that the life of your children should just be a life of fun, you're doing your children a disservice, all right? And so I'm gonna seek to jump into this subject today. I wanna show you how loving fun and pleasure actually affects seven major areas of our life. Here are the seven areas of life that fun can destroy. If you're not careful in the environment in which you and I live, where people want to be amused, people love pleasure, people want to have fun all the time from sun up to sun down, you will impact or destroy some very important areas of your life. Uh, one of the things that I would encourage you to do if you've not done it before is to look up the amount of times in the scripture the Bible describes how the child of God should be sober, sober, sober-minded. To be sober-minded is the opposite, in my mind, of being driven by pleasure and fun. It's not the only way to describe what sober-minded is, but I'm going to seek to make that case today. I'm going to take about 10 or 15 minutes this morning. Uh, I have to run into an 11 o'clock meeting, so I try to start. I try to start these right before I go into a meeting so it forces me to stay within a time frame. So, sacrificing fun for what? Here are the seven things, seven major areas that I think if your life is governed and controlled by the need for fun, the need for pleasure, to be the need to be self-indulgent, the need to have things your way all the time, all of that is related to fun. Okay? Fun affects us emotionally, spiritually, physically. It affects every area of our life. It affects our appetites for food. You know, um, it can affect the kind of food you eat and the kind of food you won't eat. It affects where you're willing to rest or sleep. It affects the mindset you have. So, here are the seven areas that I'm going to seek to look at. And I want to begin with a proverb in Proverbs chapter 21. That proverb is Proverbs 21, verse 17. And it says this, He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. Now maybe your idea is people are rich because they are misleading. People are rich because they're dishonest. People are rich because... 
they take advantage of other people. Maybe that's your view. If it is your view, it's an incorrect view. There are some people that are rich for those reasons, but that's not all of them. This text says, he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. If you develop appetites and a heart that is bent on pursuing pleasure, self-indulgence, luxury, comfort, God says you'll be a poor person. You'll be a poor person. So I'm going to make the case over the next couple days that there are people who are poor in seven major areas, not just financial poverty, right? Because they love pleasure. They love pleasure. And uh, my hope is that as you go through this material, that you will learn not to be a lover of pleasure, but a lover of God. That what you will learn is to that you will repent of your love for pleasure, right? That's acknowledging, yes, I'm guilty of this, Lord. That's me. All right? And then confessing that that's an issue. All right? And that's the key to changing areas in our life, by the way. Repentance first. So, here are the seven major areas that I think we uh, or people experience poverty in, their, in life. One is financial prosperity. I'm going to sacrifice fun for financial prosperity. Number two. I'm going to sacrifice fun for physical health. You know your love of pleasure? I have Love of pleasure has a lot of people sick in our culture. I'll show you what I mean. Probably not today. I'll probably deal with health, Lord willing, tomorrow. I will sacrifice fun for financial prosperity. Secondly, for physical health. Thirdly, for academic excellence. If you are a lover of pleasure, you will be poor intellectually. Fourth. For business success, business success, whatever that looks like, and success is a broad term. Fifth, I will sacrifice fun for personal development, personal development. Number six, I'll sacrifice fun for stronger relationships. Doesn't mean you can't build and strengthen relationships while having fun. But the fun that I'm going to identify is generally in the context of individual fun, right? Doing what I want, what I like, as opposed to esteeming others as better and doing what everybody, everyone wants and what everyone would be blessed with, right? And <clears throat> maybe if I remember, I'll talk a little bit about family fun night in our home, what that's been like over the years as... We challenge each child weekly. Each child gets to choose what they want to do for one night of the week. And to the, 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 the opportunity that we all get to see how self-centered we are because we really don't want to do what the other person wants to do. We want to do what we want to do. But because we've set up this structure, everybody has to comply. It's a good way to reveal hearts, by the way. These are practical ways that we can teach our children to be other-centered other centered. Lastly, sacrificing fun for spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. So today is going to be more of an introduction. Uh, and I decided to do this because I was listening to a book uh, this morning and um, I thought about this passage in Proverbs 21. And I recall what was said in the meetings that I was in last week. Uh, where this group of leaders were challenged to, uh, if, they're, if they want to be more engaging, make things more fun. And, and again, as I said earlier, I can appreciate that. I think that's important. I think people, it's hard to compete for attention. You're competing for the attention of listeners, of viewers, of hearers, so on. Uh, it's not always easy to get the attention of those around us. And, uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, the church is doing a lot of this now. You know, let's make things fun, and that's how we'll engage more people. I think the more you're filled with the Spirit of God and the presence and power of God is upon your life, the less you need to be fun. You know why we need so much fun in our churches? And this is all I'll say about this right now. We need a lot of fun because we lack the anointing. We lack the power of God. We lack the presence of God. The Apostle Paul had no fun when he preached all day, and a young man fell out the window and died Right? He had no PowerPoints. He had no choir. He had no drums. He had no music, no musicians. 
He just taught the word of God. I'm not saying those things are not important. I'm not saying that those things are not aids, A-I-D-S, that can be used. But we're substituting a lot because we lack the power in the presence of God. Period. And the more of God we have, as John Wesley says, you never have to advertise a fire. You never have to advertise a fire. When there is a fire, nobody has to blow a trumpet and say, Hey, neighbor's house down the block is on fire. You never have to advertise it. People from all over the area will see the smoke. They see the fire. They're attracted to it. They're drawn to it. That's what we need. All right, and that just doesn't that doesn't just relate to speaking in a context of church. Speaking, period. Right? Period. If you have nothing to say and what you have to say has is not going to connect and resonate with people that it can help them, sure, you're not going to be able to keep their attention. So sacrificing fun, sacrificing fun again for these seven areas, financial prosperity, physical health, Academic excellence or intellectual, um, yeah, academic excellence. Fourth, business success, personal development, stronger relationships, and spiritual maturity. If you're going to grow in those seven areas, pleasure cannot be your God. Pleasure cannot be your idol. Pleasure cannot be the thing that controls your life. Now, the text again, I'm going to take five more minutes, and uh, this is my introduction. Proverbs 21.17 says, He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. The context of this text is in relation to <clears throat> money. From God's perspective, some people are poor. It has nothing to do with the devil. It has nothing to do with the government. It has nothing to do with somebody oppressing them or taking advantage of them. All of these are reasons that people use to make excuses for their poverty. From God's perspective, some people are poor because they love pleasure. They're not willing to turn, to, to, to turn off the video games. They're not willing to turn off the entertainment, to turn off the television. They're not willing to go to bed early enough, to get up early enough, to start the day early enough to be able to create a level of success before other people get started. They're not willing to make the sacrifices. And so if you are a person who lives a life of indulgence, if you're a person who lives for luxury, then you'll be a poor person. Financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and all the other areas that I've identified. You will not achieve or have the kind of success that you desire to have or that God has promised to give you. Because... Your love of pleasure is getting in his way. Do you know that we can get in the way of God? Do you know that God can promise you stuff that you never receive? Yep. Doesn't fit with some people's theology, but it's biblical. God can actually promise you something, and you don't receive it because you're not diligent enough to go after it. This is why Peter says that we become partakers of God's divine nature, 2 Peter 1 through his precious, precious promises, and then he goes on to say, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge. He says, listen, you saints that are scattered abroad through persecution in his day, you need to be diligent to add to your faith. Then he goes on to say, I believe in verse 10 of 2 Peter 1, that these saints were to make their calling and election sure. They would be, they would be diligent to do that. They were to, to apply effort. They were to work at it. Right? And so, Proverbs 21, 17 says, He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. Wine and oil in, in Solomon's day was a luxury item. You know, in our day, wine and oil is not a luxury if you live in America. Right? Uh, the average person can buy a bottle of wine today. The average person, obviously, can access some of the best oils today, and all of this can be done under maybe 20 or $30. Obviously, it's not the best bottle of wine, but get the point. In Solomon's day, to access wine and oil, it is said that it would cost, on average, about 300 days wages for the average field worker. The average field worker in Solomon's day, when this was written, would need to use 300 days of wages to buy oil and wine. 
And so the point that God is making here is, this is not just somebody who loves wine and oil, because in our day, that doesn't have to be a huge investment. He's talking about those who love luxury, those who love comfort, those that Paul describes in Romans 15 as those whose God is their belly. Their belly, their God is their appetites. Their God is their desires, their pleasures, what they like, what they want. God says if that's what drives the way you build your business, the way you strengthen your relationships, the way you grow spiritually, the way you deal with finances, if your love for you, for your pleasure, for your appetites, for your self-indulgence is governing what you do, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to poverty. Now, more specifically, this text, again, says, He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. The idea is, a person who is continually spending to buy fun, buy joy, buy experiences, buy happiness. <clears throat> Look at the amount of celebrities today that have tons of money and yet are unhappy and unsatisfied. They're not able to buy satisfaction. They're not able to buy joy. You can't buy joy. You can buy happiness. But happiness is built around happenings. When nothing is happening, are you still joyful? Not if it's dependent on what's happening outside of you. But if it's dependent on what's happening inside of you, more specifically on God, on God and His Word, then you'll be able to stand, you'll be able to endure. So he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. If you love luxury, if you love the things of this world, and you are ch uh, 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 chasing those things to bring satisfaction to the soul, you're going to be poor. Because there's nothing in this world that can satisfy the inner man. Totally. Solomon has tried it all. He had a thousand women in his life, right? Concubines and wives, that wasn't enough. Solomon bought all types of amusement parks, that wasn't enough. Solomon had huge homes, not enough. Gardens, and he talked about all this stuff if you read the book of Ecclesiastes. In that book, he describes all the pleasures that he had. And not one of them were able to satisfy. They led him in, in, led, left him in spiritual poverty. And thank God for the spiritual poverty in his life, because he ends the book by saying, hear the conclusion of the matter. The conclusion of the matter is that we would, should fear God and keep his commandments. Well, anyway, that's my daily nugget of wisdom. Lord willing, tomorrow I'll jump more in depth and in detail into sacrificing fun, sacrificing fun for financial prosperity. That'll be, that'll be a lesson one, or day one. God bless you guys.